This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha, everyone. My name is uh, Mitch Yuan, um, and welcome to uh, our show, Hawaii, uh, the State of Clean Energy. I have the privilege of uh, standing in for Maria Tome, who's the uh, regular senior host, and I'm usually the junior host on this uh, program, so I'm jumping in at the deep end of the pool. So please bear with me. So today we'll be uh, talking about wave energy, and if we've been driving around the streets of Honolulu the last few months, we've seen a lot of waving. So, but I'll let you off the hook. This was our little joke that we put together before we started the show. Uh, we we're going to talk about wave energy in the ocean. And I'd like to welcome our guest, uh, Dr. Pat Cross from the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, who is the Wave Energy Test Site uh, Program Manager. So, Pat, welcome to the show. Good to be here. So, I'm still going to do my opening monologue here. Um, one of the things we want to do is to highlight uh, UH and HNEI technology uh, because I don't think the general public understands or has good insight into what we are doing to try to solve um, problems that we have for society in general. And the university has very active programs and some of our guests that will be appearing here have been supporting um, uh, new technologies to solve our problems and in this case it's energy and how we can capture uh, energy uh, from waves. So that's the end of my opening monologue. So Pat, uh, first of all, how about giving us a little bit of background, your background, uh, before you came to HNEI? Sure. Uh, I was a career uh, U.S. Navy officer, right. submariner, oceanographer. Finished my, my last tour in the Navy was as the oceanographer for the submarine force here at Pearl Harbor. Right. Uh, and after that, I worked for a small company doing mostly Navy-funded uh, underwater acoustics and autonomous vehicles, and, and then had this opportunity to step into HNEI and, and run our efforts in, in wave energy. So, so how long have you been with uh, us at HNEI, Pat? <clears throat> Five years. Wow. Five long years. Five long years. <laughs> well, they go by quickly, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> and sort of generally, before we get into this subject area, what kinds of projects generally have you been doing? Well, what we're going to talk about today has definitely been the lion's share of my focus the whole five years. Right. Uh, really focused on, on supporting the Navy's wave energy test site. I've dabbled in a few other things uh, relating to OTEC, ocean thermal energy, uh, seawater air conditioning, Worked for a little while in support of some uh, photovoltaic research, right. but primarily it's been this wave energy focus and specifically focusing the Navy, uh, supporting the Navy. Right. Uh, so I know a little bit about Pat's projects. Uh, they're really cool projects, actually. Mm -hmm. it's the one we're going to talk to you about is uber cool. And so to start it off and show you, give you an impression so that we're just not talking heads up here. Uh, HNAI uh, funded a, a short uh, video produced by Royer Studios uh, out of uh, LA. It's professionally done. So, can we roll our wave energy um, video, please? The future for wave energy is potentially limitless. And while it's understandable to think that the generation of electricity from wave energy is something that works best in rough seas, such as the North Atlantic or the coast of the Northwestern United States, there's also strong potential for the use of wave energy generators in much less energetic environments throughout the world. Here we see the Azura, a wave energy prototype being prepared for deployment to the U.S. Navy's wave energy test site, located in Hawaii near Kaneohe Bay, Oahu, for testing through spring 2016.
being developed by four independent companies whose projects have been approved and are supported by the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. Navy. The Hawaii Natural Energy Institute is responsible to the sponsors for data collection, analysis and reporting as a means of independently evaluating the technology's performance. HNEI is also carrying out environmental monitoring to assess potential impacts these devices may have on the environments where they're deployed. Four of the planned five devices are what are called point absorbers, which are essentially an ocean buoy designed to move around in the waves, and the different companies have different approaches to converting that movement into electrical generation. The Azura device is a pair of vertical spars with a large heavy heave plate at the bottom underwater and then a, a float that extends between the two vertical spars and moves with the waves and converts that movement to electricity. Here at the U.S. Navy's Wave Energy test site, known as WETS, the research will be used in ongoing efforts to advance the marine renewable energy industry. At present, it's still very difficult to capture wave energy and convert it into electricity in a way that is commercially competitive with other renewables or with fossil fuels. However, population and energy demand around coastlines are both very high worldwide and the wave resource is enormous, making wave energy technology an attractive long-term proposition. Ultimately, the idea for a commercial future for wave energy would be arrays of devices, not single devices like will be tested here at a scale of, say, 500 kilowatts or a megawatt, but lots of them. Um, that's the way we're going to get toward commercialization of wave energy is deploying it in scale. WETS is the only grid-connected wave energy test site in the United States and one of only a few in the entire world. The world's eyes are really on this test site and the results that we will produce here over the next few years. So it's, it's really, it's fun to be part of. Okay, I uh, hope you all enjoyed that video. And one of the things that struck me um, uh, looking at it uh, was the actual size of these buoys. And so, Pat, how about talking a little bit about the size of these kinds of buoys and what it takes to build them and move them and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so, well, the one that was in the video was, was the Azura from Northwest Energy Innovations. And that thing weighed about 45 tons, um, and it's about 50 feet in length or, or height, depending on uh, you know when it's when it's in the vertical doing its thing. It's about 50 feet. Uh, so that sounds big, but we've actually got some coming down the the pipe that are much larger than that. Uh, there's one coming in the spring of 19 from an Irish company that's more than 10 times the size of that. 10 times? Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. like a small ship. 800 and some tons. It, it is, it is. It's yeah. like a small ship. Right. Very good, yeah. yeah. So, um, one other thing I wanted to talk about uh, before we uh, pull up your slide is, um, can you talk about the um, permitting and the layers of permitting that are required to put in a test site like this here in Hawaii? Yeah, so this is a good time to emphasize that this site is a Navy site. So it was, the infrastructure was put in place with Navy funds. So the Navy had to pursue an environmental assessment, uh, actually two of them for the two different parts of the site. And the one that established the two new deeper test berths took close to three years of, of exhaustive effort with NOAA and with local cultural concerns and with the Marine Corps base and just a lot of entities weighing in. Um, and so it's a long and cumbersome process. The good news about all that is that the Navy has undertaken that 
and pass the test basically, um, and therefore the, the site is permitted, which allows the, these developers of wave energy machines to come in and, and deploy their devices with a much simpler permitting process to go through. Right. So months instead of years of, of uh, permitting. So. <clears throat> so this allows us to attract uh, these businesses to Hawaii because we have a capability that they need Permitting is largely in place, as you say. So what kind of economic activity is this generating for Hawaii, you know, ballpark? Yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if I can throw out any numbers, but uh, certainly, the, you know, we're, we're still in fairly early stages. I, I feel like I've got enough gray hairs where we're not in early stages, but we're still in the pretty early going. So we've only dealt with a couple of devices so far, but just in dealing with those two, we've really engaged with, with a, a few partners. Right. The, the moorings themselves were put into place by Healy Tibbetts, a local company. Almost all of our at-sea work is done by Sea Engineering, another Hawaii company. Uh, so we're, we're definitely making some infusions into the local economy, but so far still on a fairly small scale. Right. So from the point of view of uh, UH uh, resources, I mean, it's more than just HGNEI. What kind of other departments did we call upon, like in SOAS, like, you know, the weather people, the, you know, the forecasting people? Can you kind of give us an over a top level view of that? Sure, yeah. The, there are others at UH who are involved, uh, particularly in ORE, Ocean Resources Engineering, which is an academic department in which resides our wave forecaster. So this, this is a researcher who is incorporating high resolution winds, which also come out of SOEST at UH. Uh, so that's a UH run uh, forecast model for the winds and for the waves. Uh, and it's a very important part of what we do at WET. Uh, but we also collaborate on the engineering side with, with other researchers in ORE and in mechanical engineering to some extent over in the College of Engineering. Um, so yeah, there are others involved at UH and, and we hope, to, we like the idea in the future of involving more and more people right. at UH. So this is really good for our young people, our young engineers coming up through the ranks to look at this kind of engineering and get the experience that they otherwise wouldn't get. I mean, I would think that this is really attractive to them and interesting. I think so. In fact, just this fall semester, we're now using some of our Navy funds to, to support a master's student and a PhD student who were attracted to just that. Hey, these guys are doing cool stuff actually in the water right. uh, rather than purely theoretical. And so, yeah, I think that's, that has a cool factor to a lot of right. young folks. So we're going to be uh, cutting to a break, but before we uh, do that, can you just give us some idea of the level of funding that this requires and where basically the funding is coming from? Well, I just tallied it up and, and we, to date, we have drawn in uh, a, a little over $18 million of Navy funding. It's, it's really congressional funding that's coming through the Navy, through our applied research right. lab at the university. So that's the DOD side, but uh, but DOE also invested a considerable chunk you, of money. DOE being the Department of Energy. Sorry, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> not the Department of Education, but the Department of Energy uh, made the substantial initial investment to establish uh, HNEI as a support entity to the development of this test site. Right. So that brings me to the question of how many other test sites are there out there like this, and you know, is there competition in this area or, or do we all cooperate? Not really. I guess you could consider it competition on some level, but there are very few test sites globally. The, 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 the big one in the world is still EMAC, which is the European Marine Energy Center in mm -hmm. Scotland. Um, they have been in existence the longest and have tested the most wave and tidal energy uh, devices there. Um, but our site is the only one in the U.S. and there's one in the U.K. and I'm aware of efforts to establish test sites in Korea, in Japan, um, and in Spain, and uh, France is looking at one. So there are others in various stages of development, uh, but so far we're one of the few shows in town for an actual grid-connected place to test wave energy converters. Right. 
Okay. So um, are we ready for a break now? Yes? Yep. Well, let's go for it, and then we'll change the venue. We have a nice uh, slide that we'll talk to in the second half of the show. Thanks. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. If you're not in control of how you see yourself, then who is? Live above the influence. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me. everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. So welcome back to the second half. Um, Rich, could you uh, put up our one and only slide? We didn't want to kill everybody with death by PowerPoint. So we have one slide that covers a lot of ground. And I'm going to ask uh, Pat to uh, walk us through this slide. So starting at the whatever you want to start, just tell him where you want to be, and then he can kind of zoom in on that part of the slide. Um, well, OK, sure. Uh, so. This is a slide put together uh, uh, recently to, to just kind of capture everything about the, our work at the test site in one slide, which of course is, is difficult to do, but there's some highlights on here. They're basically in the upper left, you have a little map that shows where the three test berths are. So the, the test site consists of, uh, of three berths at 30, 60, and 80 meter water depths for testing different sizes of wave energy converters. Um, uh, below that is a picture of um, the Azura, which was shown in the video during its deployment. Uh, and then below that is a photo of the Lifesaver device, um, which was the next in line. So that, that one was deployed uh, for about a year, ending in April of 2017, but has stayed here in Hawaii, as did the Azura. So both of these devices actually have been deployed twice now. So uh, we, we learned some things in the first deployment and, and then got them back out there. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the Lifesaver project in particular, but we did some modifications to the Azura and redeployed it. Uh, in an effort to improve its power performance. And we have now deployed the Lifesaver uh, for its second time. Uh, the other, the pictures of the boat there on the bottom uh, of the screen right now are a vessel that our partner C Engineering, the local company I mentioned, uh, is outfitting. We are, we are funding them to outfit this as a dedicated vessel for the test site. Um, so that project is under underway and is actually nearing completion. Um, these pictures are a bit out of date. But. So that's being outfitted here in Hawaii. So it's yes. like, I'll push the business side. So that's business for our local shipyards, yes? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. That work is happening right in Honolulu. Okay. So we still have some more pictures, or is that it? Uh, I can talk to some of the other graphics yeah. on there if yeah, you're like, well, let's see, at the top right, the, the, the instrument there and the, and the graph to its right kind of represent one of the bigger things we do in, in terms of environmental monitoring, which is, uh, which is acoustics. So one of the permitting concerns about these things is do they make harmful sounds that, that could uh, be damaging to marine mammals or fishes or other, or other critters out there in the ocean? So we collect acoustic data, uh, which to date with the two devices uh, really has made the point that these things don't make a ton of noise. Uh, right. So far, we're well below any thresholds of concern. Uh, but we'll continue to monitor that as larger devices with more power output come, come along. Um, the graph with the bars there is just representing a, uh, 
another aspect of what we do to support the test site, which is develop power matrices. So, so a wave energy converter, unlike a wind turbine where you have a power curve, um, with waves, your power output it depends both on the period of the waves and the, and the height of the waves. So you have a power matrix. And so that's, we generate a, an independent power matrix for each device that gets deployed. Um, and I think that's probably good enough for the, for the slide. I just want to talk a little bit about the ag aggressive environment that these, uh, you know, this equipment is deployed in. I mean, both you and I have a Navy background, so we know uh, what the sea does. But mm -hmm. uh, let's talk a little bit about how well this uh, heavy equipment stands up in the water, the moorings, and a little bit about corrosion and things like that. Is that I've given you three things to talk about. Well, they, they all kind of come under the, the umbrella of uh, it's really hard to work in the ocean. Right. And it's really expensive to work in the ocean. Um, so, yeah, moorings, we've had, we've had a number of problems and challenges to overcome already. Moorings of, right. are, are one of them where we're spending a lot of our time right now rethinking some mooring systems. Um, but these, it, it, it kind of illustrates way, where wave energy is now, which is a long way from commercial viability. Right. And that that's, you're really getting at the reasons why. It's, it's just expensive. You've got to design a machine that can survive in storms, but also operate efficiently in normal wave conditions um, and withstand corrosion and withstand biofouling and just it's a it's a it's a violent environment and keeping something that keeping something running in that environment and then when it does go down being able to service it exactly is that was my next question because you, yeah. you have to send divers or remotely operated vehicles potentially of course, any of those for you young guys out there that's really cool stuff i mean sending a remotely oper operated an rov down there to check things out with cameras and all that kind of stuff and Manipulating arms. I mean, that's really kind of fun yeah. technology to work on. It so. is. I didn't point it out on the slide, but there was a picture of the ROV that that Sea Engineering has yeah. acquired, also with our funds. Right. Uh, it's pretty state of the art. So I know tool. our students in the engineering department at UH are doing a lot of uh, work with uh, robotics and uh, underwater vehicles and all that kind of stuff. You know, I leave the office late at night, and they're all out there. All these kids are in the shop grinding away, drilling building stuff. I mean, it's really nice to see that kind of enthusiasm and interest in these guys. And then they put on their science, their science shows in the courtyard, and it's really fascinating to see the kinds of experiments or projects that they're working on. So very yeah. good. So um, kind of wrap up, you brought a couple of uh, models uh, with you that uh, I think uh, we'll get into a little bit more depth with. So if you'd like to go and Talk sure. about your model. I, I, I brought a couple of show and tell items here, mm -hmm. basically. But so I've, I've already talked a little bit about the lifesaver, and I, and I wanted to emphasize a project. So this has already been deployed for about a year at WETS. It operates by it has a taut connection beneath each of these power takeoff mechanisms to the seabed. It also has a secondary mooring system that keeps it on station. So, but as tip, the thing tip it, tip it up, oh, tip it up a bit so yeah. you can see it. As the thing uh, rocks on the waves, direct drive winches. There's basically winches in each of right. these that that winch in, winch out, and and generate power. So that's how the device works in a nutshell. So we're redeploying it this time to correct some issues that weren't done optimally the first time with the tautness of those connections. There yeah. were a little bit too much play in them the first time. Uh, and we had some issues with the hawsers that held the thing in place. So that caused some failures of those connect vertical connections. So anyway, we think we learned enough to make this a bit more reliable and a bit better in terms of power performance right. uh, the second time around. But what's really cool is right here by this house, the power for this particular device was just burned off in the first deployment. We didn't do anything with it. But now we've installed right here where there would be a, a fourth one of these power takeoffs. It mm -hmm. can host as many as five. We've deployed a University of Washington uh, sensor suite, which has uh, underwater cameras, uh, an acoustic camera, um, sonar, 
and, and optical cameras wow. with, with strobe lights, very sophisticated, quite a software development behind it um, to make all those sensors work together. Um, and we also incorporated a subsea inductive, uh, meaning wireless charging capability. Um, wow, how does so, that work? So all this is lowered through the hull of the amp, or sorry, of the Lifesaver. The, the system is called AMP, which is the adaptable monitoring package. It's all lowered through the hull and sticks out and is sensing the ocean now as we speak. So we just deployed this thing. So we just redeployed the Lifesaver. Um, with this feature, and it is getting all of its power from the wave energy converter itself. Right. So we're not plugged into shore. We're actually using wave power to do something of interest at sea. And the subsea charging thing is of a lot of interest to a lot of people. Just that you, you mentioned autonomous yeah. vehicles, and how do you get power to autonomous vehicles? Right. In general, you don't. You recover them, and you charge their batteries, right. and you put them back in. So wouldn't it be cool if there was a mothership that they could go to right. and offload their data and charge up? And that's, so that's, that's the root of that project. Uh, I, I'll just show this one briefly. This is the, the one I mentioned from the Irish company. It's a wave energy converter that's coming to us in the spring. Mm -hmm. And despite its small I, size I, in Irish line, spring, yeah. Irish spring, good, there you yes, go. yes, yeah. They should paint it green and white. Uh, <laughs> um, Despite the size, you know, they look comparable in size here, I guess, but uh, this one is, is huge. Right. It's, uh, and it ha it's called an oscillating water column. So in this case, the water surges in and the, the, the water line is about here. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is all submerged and the waves surge in and out of these chambers, forcing air through this air chamber out through a turbine here, which is a 500 kilowatt turbine. So just like the blow rock out on... Uh, it is a man-made blowhole. Right, blowhole. Uh, right. Yeah, it is a Helona blowhole, only engineered to uh, be efficient, hopefully. Right. So uh, that one is coming to us in the spring, and we're very excited about it because it really represents a big step up in both right. size and power performance, and there's a really good team behind it. So right. that's coming soon. Okay. So are we, I think we're pretty close to wrapping up. Uh, do you have any final words? Like I have one little on my cheat sheet. What's on the horizon? So, Yeah, well, so I mentioned on the near horizon is this Irish device, but we have several other wave energy converters coming. So uh, there's a company called Columbia Power, which is an, an American company, which we may see by the early fall. Uh, another American company called Oscilla Power toward the end of the year. Uh, and then... Uh, two or three more behind them that are wow. coming in 2020 and 2021. So we've got a number of wave energy converters coming. Right. We've also got a big project to, to redeploy our moorings and address some right. of the issues I mentioned. Um, that's also coming. Um, and then in the background kind of is ongoing power performance and acoustic monitoring right. and all that stuff. So great. Yeah. Okay. Well, Pat, thank you so much. Cool. Really appreciate it. Good and to, uh, to our audience out there, especially you young engineers, I uh, hope this has given you some ideas of what uh, you might be interested in doing with your career and helping Hawaii uh, become energy independent. So with that, I'd like to say aloha, and we'll get back to waving. Yeah, wave. <laughs> waving. Yes. With great energy. Thank you. Yes, uh. <laughs>